In 2012, American journalist James Foley was kidnapped in Syria. Two years later, he was killed by ISIS in a public beheading, which was quickly shared in an image online. Jim was was lovely. He was a lot of fun, a curious young man. He was very interested in life, full of life, um, and interested in storytelling. Um, Loved to read, loved stories. And I think the older... He became, he was very interested in telling stories. Um, And that's what drew him to journalism eventually. What was he actually doing in Syria? What was he trying to tell? Well, he went to both Libya and Syria right at the beginning of the Arab Spring. And um, it was quite dangerous. So a lot of staff reporters had fled the area and many freelancers were going in because it was history unfolding, literally. Folks in that area, part of the world, just yearning for the freedoms we have, um, willing to lay down their lives and rebel, if you will. Um, So he went into Syria to tell that story and to hear, you know, um, from the civilians to just see, really bring back to us here in the West what was happening. I had no idea how dangerous it was to be a freelancer in 2011 because he had no security detail, very small budget, you know, so they often stayed in the cheapest places. And, uh, yeah, uh, it was a very dangerous work. Now, he he was kidnapped, and, of course, the usual thing is demand a ransom from governments, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. the U.S. government does not negotiate. For the nine months after his kidnapping in November of 2011, it was, everything was quiet, many rumors, but we had no idea who had actually taken him. So it wasn't until the fall of 2011 or when we received the first email from the captors demanding either exchange of prisoners or 100 million euro. So Yeah. Now, the, the point about the American government not negotiating, um, not alone would they not negotiate, but they would discourage you guys if you ever had the resources, if you tried to raise the money, Absolutely. they would regard that as an offence. Absolutely. I mean, we were, uh, you know, told we would be prosecuted um, should we dare to consider raising a ransom. Other people did thanks to their governments and other intermediaries, did emerge from that captivity. When we found out he was alive, we had such hope. And then that following year, 2012, when the French came out and the Spanish, we were filled with hope. And I had been continually reassured that Jim was our government's highest priority. And so I was quite naive and really trusted that our government was negotiating for him. Do you think, uh, Diane, that Jim was treated uh, differently and badly because he was American and, uh, you know, America's not talking? Absolutely. Um, uh, I really think the the Americans, Brits, were um, very harshly treated particularly since we wouldn't even interact with them, with the captors. And then the realization that you learned, just like the rest of the world learned, that he had been beheaded. I mean, that's, it's awful. It was quite awful. It was shocking, Pat. And I really think it was shocking for our nation too, because I don't ever think um, the Obama administration ever imagined they would do what they did. To yeah. the three Americans, four in total, um, it was horrific. Now, eventually, of course, these people are apprehended and uh, Alexander Cote uh, facing trial uh, and is convicted in due time. But the extraordinary thing is that you decided that you wanted to meet him. Why? I knew Jim would have not wanted me to be afraid of him. And Jim would have talked to him. And wanted to hear his side of the story. I also wanted to tell him who Jim was, to humanize Jim for him, because I really feel for Alexander, Jim was just a symbol of any mistake our country has ever done, you know, in the world. You know, and there was great hatred towards Jim and the others. I think both of us felt quite awkward, you know, it was awkward. But he had a self-assurance about him, and he did want to tell why he did what he did, that it was in the fog of war, and he was a soldier, um, and he wanted me to hear his reasons, if you will, you know. 
But in that second meeting, he also shared um, his loss, and he did express remorse for what we as a family had gone through. Not for what he had done, which was, as he put it, in the fog of war, but because of indirectly what you had to go through. Right, right. Did you believe that was sincere? Some of it, yes. Um, But he also was experiencing his own loss, loss of citizenship, loss of his family, country, Um, showed me, very poignantly, showed me pictures of his three little daughters and started to cry, really. So I think he was the most human at that moment. You say that... Uh, had he asked for your forgiveness, that you would have given it? Well, um, it was, had he asked, I mean, he didn't. But he didn't ask. He did not. But I did feel quite a bit of empathy for him. Uh, You know, and the truth is, Pat, I think in that kind of a situation where hatred reigns, you know, everyone loses. And we had lost our beloved son, but he too has lost his freedom for his decisions. And his probably his ability to ever see his family again. You, know? yeah. you got to see President Obama. Briefly after Jim was killed, yes. Um, what, what, I mean, this is an extraordinary meeting that the, you write about it in, in the book when you went to see him in the White House. Mm-hmm. He's there behind his desk mm-hmm. drinking tea. Mm-hmm. Didn't offer you tea. Didn't think about it, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah. Your impression of a brilliant man, but maybe not, uh, well, not having the empathy that you might have expected. Right. I was, I was honored to meet him, of course, but I, you know, I was incredibly disappointed in how I had been treated as an American citizen. I felt very strongly that our country could do much better in terms of having the backs of innocent um, Americans who were taken hostage like our son was, you know. 